I started with um, Room. Yes. Because uh, I was doing this thing called The Book on One for RT Radio, and I got this book, Emma Donoghue's, and I was like, wow, this is an amazing book. I want to be able to do it. But it begins with the voice of a five-year-old Canadian kid. American, in fact. In the American, thing yeah, American, yeah. No, yeah, as yeah. in the... No, this, yeah. yeah, but like North American North kid. American boy. So I got an actor called Hilary O'Shaughnessy, whom you probably know yeah. in Dublin, and she did this incredible five-year-old voice, and it led me in, and the listener as well, to a very sordid world. Yeah. Incredible to be able to write through that prison. Amazing. When you saw what you had as a project, as a film, yet it was a book that had that very incredible stamp on it. Mm -hmm. What was that? Was that a roadblock for you? Did you need to go around that? Did you need well, to I, th I think it was everybody who talked to her about the book. That was the thing that everybody had to address. How do you translate? Do you translate? Um, how do you, or do you transpose or somehow reflect that perspective in the prose? How do you bring that into the film? Because, I mean, in fact, the one thing that, that, the thing that writing is particularly good at is, is the voice, because there is always a voice. Even if it's an omniscient third person narrator, you're still, you're listening to the sound of somebody speaking, always. And film, unless it gets into vast amounts of voiceover or silly perspective camera kind of rules of, 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 of how you shoot, um, it's much, it's, it, it, it's not a given. In fact, per perspective on who you're with in a film is, is a constantly organically changing thing. Um, and so when I read the novel, I think I had a kind of flash very early on that I, that I knew how to make it and that I could see the film and I knew that it would still be the boy's film, but without any sort of, you know, uh, trick. So that was why it was hard to pitch to Emma because I, I wrote her this very long letter. It was sort of five or 10 page letter. And she'd been getting a lot of uh, requests for the rights because the book was very successful. And she, for various reasons, hadn't gone with anybody. And then I sent her this letter thinking that it's not gonna, nothing's gonna happen with this. I, I'd only made, I'd made two films at that point, Garage and Adam and Paul. And I knew that she was being courted by lots of major producers and directors. Um, but I somehow managed to convey to her what I, how I saw it. And really what I, I think I said was that, that what you have to have faith in is the thing that film is incredibly good at doing which is presenting you with a sense of the actuality of something. Now, in Room, this is both good and bad because I, I, I think it's fairly un, uncontroversial to say that you can, you can bring a person into a kind of intimate encounter with that boy through film. But how do you do that in such a way that, that the, the circumstances of, of their lives don't just overwhelm the film tonally? You know, because I think what's amazing about the, about the novel is that uh, you somehow preserve the feeling of childish optimism and wonder and innocence, even though what he's describing is clearly to us something pretty awful. And I think I just, it, you know, there's no big trick to it. It's just about a kind of careful um, tracking of, of the scenes via the... the always keeping connected to the, to, the, to the boy's experience in the room, being with him. I mean, in fact, even in the novel, he never directly sees what's happening. Yes. So we found ways of, or just he by uses sound. He uses sound, exactly. We did that as well. And we did it with, there's a small amount of voiceover in the film. And all that does is it just, it just staples you to the kid at the beginning, twice in the center, and then once at the end so that you, you know very early on whose story it is you're following. And then you can leave that alone for 20, 30 minutes in the film. And, and just and run the film. And run the film. And yet somehow the, the suspicion that we had that, right. that, you would, that you would still be in the child's world held true. And I think what probably a lot of people went to Emma and said either you've got to use bits of animation or you've got to be absolutely rigid that it's the child's point of view, literally. Um, and all of those things I felt would kill the truthfulness of it. Mm. So you know, if you what, pinned it down, like yeah, the tent I, flapping with yeah, a couple of pegs yeah. to get the kid 
in and out. Yes. And then ran the film. Through. And then ran the film. And then in, in the individual okay. scenes, it's just amazing how, if you really fall in love with the child, as you do, this is an amazing kid yeah. that we found. Um, you just emotionally, that's the territory that you occupy as an audience going through the, the, the film. So it's, it is, it's really fascinating to me because, you know, when you switch a camera on, there's, in one sense, there's absolutely nothing, but there's no layer between that lens and what it's looking at. Yes. There's no, there's no voice involved there. Yes. I mean, everything is modulated by the voice in literature. Yes. You turn it on and what you see is what you see. But actually, of course, a film is not a shot. A film is a rolling sequence of, of shots which, which in themselves are super, you know, it has, it has a superbly um, delicate capacity to modulate the experience of the audience. And, yes. and that I just said, I think it can be done and it can be done in a very truthful way where the, where the architecture of, of perspective is not visible to the audience. All the time that you talk about this, you're also talking about some, something that probably concerns you, that we see real life court cases happening of people who've done just that. Yes. So the film gets you into that world. Yeah. But if you look across the spectrum of what you've done, Garage, Adam and Paul, what Richard did, which I viewed last week. Yeah. I have a teenage kid myself, I understand. Yeah. yeah. With a growing fear as yeah. I watch the beginning of your movie. Yeah. That's I know it's gonna happen because yeah. I read the papers. Yeah. But you're building it. But because yeah. there's something in you that's firing in you to deal with social yeah. issues that we all know about. Yeah. But the film gives you another layer. Yeah, the, the, the other layer is the important thing to me because if art can do anything, it can open up a, a broader space than just the kind of issue space that we normally yeah. talk in. So when we talk about these things, they, they're, usually, um, they're usually a response to an immediate event. You know, they're an immediate response to an event that's happened. So you're in the cut and thrust of you're talking about whatever the most recent case is. And, and it's confusing and, and oneself, one finds it hard to, to make sense of that. And I think what happens when you decide to make a film about it is you then, you fictionalize so that you don't, so that your, your imagination is, is, is free. And then you've got a chance to meditate on that for the full, uh, you know, with the full weight of your, your, your kind of emotional and intellectual capacity, you're free to meditate on that for the, for a long period of time and, and maybe say something more considered about it. Yeah. And, and I think hopefully also give it its human weight, okay. if you know what I mean. So that it's not just the case of, it's not just the doing and the suffering and the guilt or the innocence. It's the fact that real people's lives it's are involved. It's context, isn't it's it? It's context, yeah, absolutely. It's context and it's resonance so that you think I mean, you know, for, for example, the choice of the, the perpetrator as the center of, this, of that story is not because I don't have uh, empathy for the victim, absolutely not, of the victim's family. It's because the perpetrator is the active party. Yes. And if we're going to understand these things, then it, those are the people that we need to understand. Yeah. And it's a bit, it's a, it's a little bit like, um, I don't know, I've, I'm also working on a project, I've been working on it for a long time with Enda Walsh, the playwright, which oh, yeah. is, yeah. He's a nice buddy of mine, actually. Oh, he's I fantastic. I did stuff with him. Oh, did you? On radio, yeah, we did a radio play. Oh, oh did you? Oh, he's brilliant. Yeah. So you'll know what so he's you're like. you're bugging away on that as well. Yeah, right? and, and it's, a, it's a thing which is said, it's a Second World War story, but it's from the point of view of, of, a, of a man who, a real character, this, yeah. in this case, who did, who did terrible things in the, in the war. And it's trying to understand how it's possible for a person to do that because okay. they're the harder questions than, than the kind of simply, you know, experiencing the consequences. It's understanding the, the causes. You've got probably several things popping along at the same time. Yeah. Like if you were to say, right, Lenny wakes up and there's post-production on whatever. Yeah. And there's the bubble away stuff within yeah. that that's yeah. happening. How do you work it out in relation to your time, from the time you get up to saying hello, yeah, kids, family, wife, whatever, yeah, and then off to all off the other bits work. and pieces? Yeah. Do you parcel it out? I try to, but I'm actually pretty disorganised. <laughs> <laughs> so you, as know. you're asking me that That's question, I'm thinking, God, how do I? <laughs> um, I, I think I'm pretty. I, I unfortunately just fight the most immediate fire usually. Gotcha. Um, but the great thing now is that um, I have 
a sort of a, a support team in that I work very closely with Ed Guiney and, and Andrew Lowe in Element Pictures. And I have a desk there, I've got a, dis, uh, a development team that work across their slate but also specifically um, sort of have a mandate to work with me and to help me find stuff and to, and so they will remind me, put things in front of me, um, I can, I get a lot of scripts now which is, this is sort of in the last two years and in fact even really since word has got out that room is looking good or whatever because some people have seen early cuts and there was generally positive reaction in Cannes where it sold and that was based on a promo so suddenly because it's a very small industry really it is yeah you go from not being from from a nobody ever heard of you to being on everybody's list for okay. their projects and so okay. you get all these scripts and if I was to read all of them I wouldn't be able to do anything else so I have people who, who know my interest and would know if something was going to be of interest to me so that this filter is there. They're your gatekeepers in some ways. Yeah, to your, exactly. Your and focus. I, you know, it's taken me 20 years of making stuff to get to a point where I feel like there's a kind of a, a viable uh, structure. And, okay. and, but, but it's a really interesting question what you say. I think at the moment I'm in a kind of tr a, a very a crossroads because what I've decided is the one thing that I really have to do, which was never a problem before because nobody was ringing me and, or you, you know, I was, I, I certainly made, I've been very lucky and I've made films and I've, you know, made a life out of that. But at the same time, there were, I had plenty of open space around the projects to think. I never sort of considered that as a, as a, yeah. as a luxury. Yeah. And now I realize that it is. And the one thing that I am going to do is be pretty brutal about marking out time where I'm not re in a reactive mode to whatever oh, right. I'm at, but I just get to read and think okay. and do the usual stuff. What you, like it's very important that you still get up, read the papers, do whatever it is you do, oh, listen yeah. to the radio, tune in. Otherwise, this list of films wouldn't be there. That, That's that, right. Yeah, you and, would have done those. Yeah, and also to just reflect on what you've done and and think about because I really still feel. I mean, it probably is a, a good thing to feel, but I really feel that I haven't got to it yet, the thing that I really, I haven't really got to it yet. I mean, I hope I always feel that maybe that, that but that there are, there are things in film, possibilities in film that I'm only just beginning to yeah. get a handle on and I want to go you, for those. But you've been busy. Yeah. Do you know, there might have been space between the gigs or whatever it is yeah. and you know, you might have had the volume of scripts hitting the desk. Yeah. yeah. But to look at the output and to see the contact level. Yeah. You still find time though, and it's really interesting. Every year that this festival happens, yeah. you're here. Yeah. Why is uh, that? Because I, re I love it and my wife loves it. I mean, I think Pauline was saying that she might get her to come over and chat to you because she's, oh, be she's great about this place particularly. But I, it, you know, the funny thing is there isn't, although I work a lot now and I'm, I'm traveling a lot and all that, a lot of the time um, it's, you rarely get to, to just sit with people and have conversations. It's usually about something and it's, it's for the purpose of something. Most film festivals <coughs> are extremely stressful and not very enjoyable. I mean, I think a load of people, if you drill down into directors, they would say the same thing. Like having, having, a, film in a, in a, having a film premiere in a, in, a, in a big festival is one of the most stressful things that, that I've ever experienced. Why? Because there is a huge big kerfuffle around it. There are always issues whether you're, you're worried about the projection, you're worried about whether it's going to, how it's going to play. If the film hasn't been sold, so quite often you bring your film to that, yeah. to the big festival to sell it, then there is a kind of uh, a sword hanging over you, which is if you don't sell it, that's, you know, the more they cost and the more the expectations rise, the more it's no longer just sort of some lovely, pure celebration of the work that you've done. The festival is a kind of marketplace and you're bringing your cattle. And if they're not bought, you're bringing them back home. So, so, I, so for me, I mean, at, at Sundance where we, were, where we brought Frank, I was really, I, we had, there was sound problems in the projection. I was just, and my wife eventually said to me, we're, we're in this absolutely beautiful place. You know, they put us up in a lovely hotel, the skiing going on, and you're just so fucking miserable. <laughs> will, you, will you snap out of it? And I kind of did. I thought, this is ridiculous. But, but actually, it is very, it's not particularly enjoyable. Cannes is an absolute bun fight. It's like, it's, it's I don't know, it's, 
it's jammers, it's everything in your ear is about who's up, who's down, what projects are hot, everything is hierarchy. It's designed to, to, to put your ego under tremendous pressure. Now, leave park aside all those festivals, um, which are most definitely work, and there are, there's only, there are only two festivals, or it's, there's a, there are a few festivals that I've loved, and they're all smaller festivals. All right. And they're where the, the spirit of the love of cinema still trumps the yeah. commerciality of Because when selling. you look outside there, it says, our village is our screen. Yeah. And that's the motto. That's it. And, you know, there's one other festival that I think is, and it's, I think, one of the best festivals in the world. And it's the only other one that I think is equivalent to Skull, which is a great compliment because it's, it's called Telluride. It's in Colorado. It happens just before Toronto. And it's... It's the cinephile festival in, in America. It happens on this one big main street in this town. Um, there's, there are quite a few similarities, but it's where everybody goes from Hollywood who really cares about cinema. Press don't get free accreditation. They buy their own tickets. Um, there's no hierarchy. It's really, the, I, took the, I took Adam and Paul there and um, literally I was so overwhelmed by this place and we were invited to a party in this beautiful house above the town. And I stepped backwards and stood on somebody's toe. <laughs> and I said, as I was saying sorry, I turned around. I, it, was, it was George Lucas who was talking to Harrison Ford. <laughs> and I was, I, 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 you know, I had to sort of excuse myself and go to the toilet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but the skull has that quality. Of, yeah, yeah. Of, it's a real place. The people are yeah. gorgeous. I mean, and, yeah. and I love, I just love coming back. I would come here every year. And perhaps as well, too, that your wife would like to be here. So, you know, we talked earlier about the fact that it would be nice to find a place that you could go to that is not Dublin, that is not home yeah. necessarily. In some ways, this place represents that side as well, doesn't it? It does, and it's, it's a proper family tradition now. Is it? Yeah, yeah. In, a, in, a, in a life where you don't... It's hard to have family traditions now, the way people's lives are. And we look forward to this every year. I couldn't come last year because I was in uh, North America getting ready to shoot. Yeah. And I really missed it. So... Uh, and we're, we're here from the Wednesday till the I know, I till Monday, which yeah. is just brilliant. Because I'm not we just going, love it. you said. I'm yeah, staying I'm here. I'm staying. Yeah. yeah, that's lovely. And also the people are... Uh, it's amazing who it attracts, you know. Yeah, it is. Uh, Mike Lee was here. That's right. I saw Mike Lee walking out of the hardware store. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Then, and, and, and Greg Dyke, um, yeah, Greg who, Dyke who interviewed me about two years ago, That's right, which yeah. I thought was the, that was the biggest trip ever, yeah, you know? Yeah, I know, yeah. So, and, and then you get, oh, and Jim is such a friend of the festival, and, yeah. uh, and then all these filmmakers who, there's got to be something special about it that well, it like attracts everybody. Stephen Frears was here, yeah. sitting in that chair last year, and yeah. I said to him, um, about career, I said, you know, um, you've got Hollywood running around, you know, looking for gigs. He says, I know. He said... I'm like a spoiled child, really, that I'm, you know, killed for choice in terms of what I do. Is that the road you're going on? Because you're now beginning to get, if I may say yeah. so, the names, as yeah. in Frank, yeah. the past or the others yeah. coming in, yeah. Maggie. Um, yeah. And then so in, are they dealing yeah. cards to you now that they didn't before? Is yeah, I, I, there are definitely, if I wanted to um, sort of, if, yeah, I, I, I have a good reputation as an actor's director and actors, All right. that, which, is, which gives you a certain amount of power because actors are the, are the people that attract finance as well. So, yes. and I, th I mean, I think Frizz has a really interesting career. You know, he, he, he's quite eclectic in what he chooses, but there's still, he still is who he is. Yep. Um, I think that because I also write, um, and because, as I said earlier, I'm very keen to, to create some space for myself. And I want to, there's some projects that I want to do that will, that are very much um, intimate, difficult, small projects, which, which, which are, and it's vital for me that I continue to do those. But I do have such a kind of interest in cinema across the spectrum. And I, and I seem to have the capacity to, to understand different ways of, making films so I'm quite versatile all right I think I have the capacity probably to take some some projects that come from outside which are just really interesting and as they come in I think the only thing I can do is to just look at them one by one and and see what happens I 
don't I think still the majority of the things that I do will be generated from within the family as it were all right but okay. but I wouldn't just don't know it's too too, too you're hard open to, to offer yeah as well. absolutely in yeah. other words the, yeah. the career beckons yeah um, finally when you kind of look at you know you're a relatively young man um, as you get older say you were a football player or whatever it is I was in the company of one last night he's yeah. 71 former soccer player and the old body's gone at this yeah. stage. But he was talking to me about the fact that when you're a footballer, you've got to hang up your boots at 40, say, yeah. max. Yeah. And that's a radical shift, change. Oh, yeah. You're never going to have to do that. No, I mean, I, you know, you're touch in, you're, wood, well, yeah. Look at it, health, touch wood, do you? Health, health permitting, I health can't permitting. ever see myself stopping this. No. And it's brilliant because uh, I don't know at this, I mean, I really don't know what else I'd do. I, I, I would write, probably. But if I can write, I can make films. So, I, and it's funny, it doesn't, my father is 82, and he's really only just retiring. Gotcha. And he's not even really that able to say that. You know, he's still kind of working on bits and pieces. And I need the, some of, I think some of that's good. I, I, I kind of just have an active brain it needs to be stimulated otherwise I kind of end up getting you know it just it doesn't do me any favors not to be busy it suits me to be busy um and I also just like the I like I'm I am excited by ideas and yeah yeah you know yeah, and I so know you know why wouldn't you yeah. just do it if you can yeah I agree if, if somebody's prepared to give me the money then I'll keep doing it we could talk all day we could but it's lovely. That was great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aidan. That was lovely. Thanks a million.